The subject of Alternative Views News Magazine for the evening is Boy Prostitution, the widespread use and abuse of male children for sexual purposes. Some of the language in the program may be offensive to some people. Admittedly, the whole subject is offensive. Investigations in other cities have shown that boys, 13, 14, even younger, are coerced into prostitution with threats of physical violence and are sometimes shipped across state lines, shipped to the older adult men who desire young boys for sexual acts. Occasionally, these boys' episodes with their older clients ends in physical violence. There are men who seek young boys to torture and sometimes to kill. Young boy prostitutes, 14 and 15 years old, explained one reason they sell their bodies to older men is for money. For some, especially the runaways, the money means survival. A child, an adolescent psychiatrist, explained another motivation. As revenge against a father, stepfather, or older man who sexually molested him at an earlier age. best information I have is, is that these kids die. They waste away, they kill themselves, somebody kills them. And that's it. And we're talking about over half. Over half of the kids who make their living this way for a period don't survive adolescence. It's the slaughter of the innocents. It's the greatest slaughter of the innocents since Herod. And it goes on and on and on. And when the public gets a, a hint of it, nothing happens. Part two of Boys for Sale, the tragedy of male children being sexually exploited by older men, tonight on Alternative Views News Magazine. In our previous program, the first section of this two-part series on boys for sale, the widespread use and abuse of youth for the gratification of various men around the country, we talked about the general nature, who's involved, what kids, where they come from, how they got involved in it, the nature of the men themselves, the ages, the fact that they come from the highest the socio-economic and political stratum of the Amer of American society. The fact that this is a very widespread thing and that it is hushed up generally and it's extremely violent. Kids are killed, many kids are killed and tortured every year as well as abused. Tom Philpott is still with us, history professor at the University of Texas, Mark McKinnon, former editor of the Daily Texan. But before we get into tonight's program further, we will review some of the most important points of the first section of Boys for Sale for people who may not have seen the first program. Investigations in other cities have shown that boys, 13, 14, even younger, are coerced into prostitution with threats of physical violence and are sometimes shipped across state lines, shipped to the older adult men who desire young boys for sexual acts. Occasionally, these boys' episodes with their older clients ends in physical violence. There are men who seek young boys to torture and sometimes to kill. The President's Commission on Obscenity found, this is the commission that Richard Nixon repudiated, it mentioned in passing that child pornography was a phenomenon of the abuse of children and then went on to say that for every female prostitute of any age in the United States there are nine boys underage who are prostitutes. And there was a call boy ring operated out of New York City which had phone hookups with Houston, Atlanta, Los Angeles, New Orleans, Washington DC. 
And that callboy ring had a list of 10,000 clients who could call and with a credit card purchase a boy. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is uh, credit card number 06789. Uh, I'd like to make an order, please. Go ahead. I'm looking for a young male, blonde hair, blue eyes. Body hair or no body hair? Thick body hair, please. What age? Uh, 10 to 12. Butch or fam? Butch, please. What is your address? I'm at the Houston Marriott Hotel, room 313. Wire me $200 now by credit card and have $100 in cash for the boy. He'll be there in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. In Houston, I, I give the figure based on, I think, prudent calculations that upwards of 350 boys a year are killed deliberately because of this. Many more die of drug overuse, mal malnutrition, of suicide. The national toll per year is in the thousands every year. Kids die violently because of this. And to the best of my knowledge, most men who seek sex from boys are not homosexuals. To the extent that they have active sex lives uh, at the peer level, they are heterosexual. Many of them have no peer sex at all. There are gay people who are what we call pederists, that is, men who lust after children, especially boys, but it appears to be the case that most such men are not gay, that their uh, attraction is for young, defenseless children, especially boys, because they're more exotic, and more forbidden. But uh, it is not a matter of uh, gay rights as advocated by practically anybody. This is a a much different sort of phenomenon. The reason that the gay community usually scorns any investigation of the subject is that they know that the average person in the public will blame homosexuals and homosexuality for the phenomenon, regardless of what facts are presented. The kind of individuals involved are down the line, almost in every instance in the cases I've investigated, men who are very powerful, usually very wealthy, and usually administrate control over a large number of people. 16-year-old Boyd came to us telling how he'd started as a prostitute at age 12 and now is employed by a large Houston corporation. The corporation pays him from a well-covered slush fund. I'm working right now, you know, like, just, you know, with the corporation. And What's that? How's that work? Well, uh, when their executives are you know, their business people are in town. Uh, they're sent to our apartment, and we entertain them while they're here. Okay, what's that entertainment usually involved? What do they usually demand, or what do they want? Well, it's all kinds of sex and perversions. There's no two alike. I've decided that. Subsequent to the making of this interview, this boy's mutilated body was found. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. The Texas House Committee has been charged with looking at the problem. Two public hearings later, the committee has been unable to make any serious progress. Its budget was slashed from $80,000 to $15,000, hardly enough to do an honest probe. And the committee chairman admits to knowing of the problem in Houston, but says he's been told to back off. When we started this committee, we asked for money to do an adequate investigation to determine just how serious the problem of child pornography, child prostitution, sexual exploitation is here in Texas, which I think is, is a, a proper a thing for this committee to do. Now, that was the first indication that we had pressure on us. The second indication was when I appeared before the House Administration Committee, when they chopped our budget and subsequent conversations with certain members that said, We're, we 
have got to stop our investigation. Why do they want you to stop? I don't know why. I have no... Do you plan I, to find out? I plan to find out. I think it's serious that they're, they're, they were getting this kind of pressure. Let's continue talking about this situation. You have a story here which kind of is uh, uh, good for several aspects of who's involved, what happens to them, and what doesn't happen to them. Okay, I'll read a wire service release which came out of Dallas and which said at the top, broadcasters note nature, and repeated, broadcasters note nature, and also said, note discretionary material. Here's the copy. A 30-year state human resources department employee has been arrested in Dallas on charges of sexually abusing a child. The Department of Human Resources officials say 55-year-old Howard Ray Parker was suspended yesterday from his job as Medical Services Program's director, that's statewide. Police say they found two to 300 pictures of nude boys in Parker's home. Wow. Officers say a 16-year-old runaway boy alleged Parker had sex with him while he lived with Parker. A spokesman for the Department of Human Resources in Dallas says the 30-year veteran employee charged on sex offenses has been suspended without pay. It goes on to say that this is routine procedure. Uh, it repeats that he's charged with the abuse of a child he picked up on the street as the kid was hitchhiking. The, it says that the boy alleges that Parker kept him in that apartment of his for a month and that Parker repeatedly attacked him during that time. Police say a search of Parker's house uncovered two to three hundred photographs of boys in various states of attire, and many showed them engaging in sex. Now, it happens to be the case that those boys were charges of the Department of Human Resources. And here's what happened in the case. Mr. Parker went under the care of a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said that prosecution would be uh, damaging to Mr. Parker and prevent his recovery. The judge took that into consideration in the pretrial hearing and let him go. And the state of Texas paid for his psychiatric care and they returned him to the job after his rehabilitation. He went back to work? He went back to work. What about the kids? Did they do anything to rehabilitate them? <sighs> Whatever they were supposed to be doing in the first place. Let's take a look at the children involved and their lives. Robin Lloyd, author of For Money or Love, the definitive book on boy prostitution in America. I think that it's been described as a national national horror. I don't think it's a national horror. I think it's a national tragedy. My findings are that the boys that get into this, as, as described in the title of the book, For Money or Love, they're not really in it for the money. I think that they're in it for what they perceive to be adult attention or adult affection. Um, that's where it becomes a tragedy. If you take a 12-year-old boy who comes into a strange town, he's broke, he's cold, he doesn't have anything, he's hungry, and then the other street boys will tell him, hey, you know, you've got something you can sell. And he finds he has this marketable commodity I mentioned earlier. So now he goes to the apartment with a strange man. They go to bed together. The next day he's out on the street and he's looking for now the, the same kind of, of, of protection that same night. Their life is sad. It's 100% it's sad. They get up, you know, one or two or three during the day and they go out and they have to earn money and they're treated bad. Uh, they eat only when they're fed by somebody else and they never get anything for anything. They always have to return sexual favors for it. They sometimes get beaten, they get robbed, they get pushed. You know, the police abuse them, everybody abuses them. What do you do with the money? Spend it on um, I have to stay with somebody, I pay them that, or um, just give me something to eat when I need it. And I buy me some shoes or some socks or whatever I need. How much are you guys getting for a trick? You gotta be able to make some bucks. We're gonna get more than five dollars. Trying to use some money, but when we need it bad. No, we we bucks for days old. Oh, no. So I can make money, man. There's no other way. No other way you can make money? That's Listen, true, there ain't. Job, I ain't can't find no I coke bottles around these days. People already tuck them all up. Uh, 14, I, I can't get it. Yeah. I ain't going to walk a job. Yeah. Most of the kids don't want to be where they are. They don't want to 
engage in this lifestyle. And if you give them help, uh, an awful lot of them, a very high percentage of them, are quite anxious either to go home or to uh, get a job, go back to school, to live a normal, happy life. They are not into this really rotten thing because they like it. If they stay in it long enough, they develop attitudes that make it very difficult for them to do anything else. If you work here in our center and you do not develop a bad memory, you don't work here very long. The tragedies, the, the violence, the, the, uh, the fact that some of the kids that come into us are killed because they cannot escape the, the exploitation is a very hard thing to bear. Our staff does not really last very long here. Who's running? I can't tell you. Why? They do something? Something like that. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, if they have that many kids, what's what's their, uh, where, where is it located? I mean, is it, what part of town? I'm not going But you're not going to tell me the location. <laughs> I don't know. If they're running slowly, slowly. Yeah. The youth then detailed how boys are procured and then held by the servants. Strictly all the boys are music. closed circuit. All the boys are music. Oh no, these guys, you know, like hitchhikers that are hitchhiking in, they pick them up, give them a place to stay, and then tell them, look, you owe us some money. All fairly young? Very young. What's the youngest? Uh, nine. Nine years old. Well, this is one little kid. Little but they have all the way up to, what, 18, 20? 20. 20 now, do, they, do they provide y'all with protection? I mean, are they protected? Well, Vice doesn't touch them. But you don't know why. Or do you know why? I don't know why. All I know is Vice doesn't touch them. Do they teach the kids how to perform sexually at this point? Do they teach them how to do it? I mean, like, well, usually they get some... It's a good teacher. The train. <laughs> what happens if a kid won't perform? Do they kind of get down on him pretty heavy? <laughs> no, they just get rid of him. Well, how do they keep him quiet? You know, so he won't talk. Well, they usually have an exam. Well, once they will break a finger or two. Have they done that in front of you? Yeah, they've done it a couple of times. Some John, you know, like, didn't pay up. One time they took him into the room and they broke his finger. One at a time. Boys told our undercover investigator, a former drug rehabilitation counselor and sex therapist, that they are not proud of what they do. You don't live at home? Nah, I go home once in a while. Did your mother know you do that? She didn't care? She don't like me come around the house too much. If I, do, if I do that, she don't like me come around too much. Why not? She says she just don't like her son being hustling and stuff like that. She knows you're hustling? Yeah. This dude wanted to take some pictures of me for $100 tonight. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> this is stupid stuff. Well, Seven. Can, yeah. Why do you say it's stupid? You're doing it. Well, hey. <laughs> you gotta live. I'm ashamed of it, too. You're ashamed of it? Sure. Why? Hey, man, I wasn't brought up this way. What kind of family are you from? Uh, I have real nice people. I mean, you know, it was me that messed Did up. Your parents know what you're doing? Oh, no. She know I'd never let them know. I, I, God. <laughs> Hell, I've heard them too many ways already. Well, the reason I'm here is, you know, when I was 13 years, well, I was 10 years old when my mom got remarried. And when she did this thing she married, came into my room and raped me, and they had to take me to the hospital and put three stitches in me. You know, That's when you were 10? Yeah. So then what happened? How'd you end when up I, leaving home? When I, when I turned 13, I just, you know, packed up my bags and trucked on. What do your parents think you're doing, or what's your mother think you're doing then? <laughs> I don't know what they think. I haven't written them a letter since the uh, year before last. They don't care, you don't think? No. This boy was partially a victim of poverty. On the streets, though, you find boys from varied backgrounds. One 15-year-old from a wealthy family tells of being cast out because he was failing in school. His parents are divorced. Neither his father nor his mother wants to care for him. He started out as a prostitute when he was 12. You gonna keep hustling here? Yeah, I have to. I mean, you know, where's a 15-year-old gonna get a job, man? 
It wasn't too likely. What do you think about what you do? Are you proud of it? No. I think uh, disgusting, revolting, you know. Why, why do something that's disgusting and revolting? Well, you gotta eat and you gotta sleep, you know? Well, the worst they could do is kill me, you know? Well, that's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, aren't you worried about that? Don't you value your living? Not right now, I don't. You don't value your life? <laughs> Not really. You don't want to I stay mean, alive? I mean, I, I want to stay alive and all, but, you know, if I die, what the f I mean, it can't be much for you. <laughs> I know, I mean, is it that bad out there? Don't you, don't you look forward to the day when you get a, a good job? Yeah, but that's all I can do is look forward, you know? I live each day as it comes. So you're really not happier? No. I'd much rather be at home, you know? Well, down in Houston, they have streets where they hustle, which you don't find in some other cities, right? That's right. Uh, what kind of a... Now, this is apparently... These are the entrepreneurs, as the uh, D.C. guy talked about, right? These are cold little kids looking for uh, money to, to buy some food, money to get a room, hopefully with some privacy, uh, with somebody if they can't get any privacy. Uh, to put it in, in, in the bluntest terms, at 2 in the morning, when the bars close, the boys who've had only one customer that night and need more money, or haven't had any customers at all, start bidding against each other for the favors of whatever pedras are patrolling the street. You've actually observed this? Yes, right, yes. That's at 2 o'clock. It lasts for about an hour, a little longer, and then some kids are left, and many of them have nowhere to go. They might have what they call a trick pad that they can go to, and I hope they get the 25 bucks to pay the rent there the next day. I've seen them climb under cars to get shelter and warmth. To and sleep, if, you mean? Yes. At 4 in the morning on this one night in November when it was cold, and the boys had T-shirts on, not jackets, and they didn't have jackets. These are mostly cool. uh, destitute, well, you might say, street people. Well, they might come from well-to-do yeah. homes, Doug, but when they're yeah. gone for a few months, they're, they're poor. Down they are now poor. A rough count that I made was that there are 400 kids in uh, an area of uh, half a square mile. Is there any... Uh, now, let me finish okay, the story. Sure. The police then came and rounded them up in vans, and I heard over police radio that their count was that there were 400 kids. And they drove them to a suburb of Houston called Pasadena and let them out. Mm. Why did they do that? They did it because if they formally arrested them, they would have had to book them and put them someplace and they had no room for them. If they had room for them, they couldn't have protected them from other people in the jails. They didn't have the heart to arrest them. Uh, it, technically, they arrested them by taking them into custody, but they didn't have the heart to do any more. They wanted to clean up the street because this was the week before the national election in 1980. They had no place to find shelter for them because there were only 42 beds in the whole city and some of those were questionable as to their safety for the boys. So they took them for a ride and let them out. They didn't have anything else to do. Tom, is race a factor here and if so, in what degree, what extent? It's a, f a factor in a surprising way, Frank. Uh, We've already mentioned, but maybe not emphatically enough, that these kids are poor. Uh, once they're out on the street, even if they come from middle class families, they become poor. But overwhelmingly, the runaway kids are from poor families, from struggling families. You would assume then that they would be heavily minority kids. This isn't the case. Overwhelmingly, the kids who are throwaways, runaways, who hit the streets and work in the life are white. Part of the reason is that the market among the well-to-do men for boys is a white market. The men want white kids. They don't want Chicanos. They don't want black kids. They want white kids, fair kids, Nordic-looking kids, uh, the ideal type. What about wealthy black or Chicano males? They also tend to prefer white kids. You can find in what's called the Farm League, uh, in the parks, on the streets, at the curbs, uh, totally on their own, 
I'm living hand to mouth, roughing it. You can find minority kids, but they have a hard time. They have a hard time getting customers. Mostly, they get employed in the dark, literally. They work in uh, the cubicles, in the uh, magazine stores, where their, their customers won't see them. There's an ugly term call, called glory hole for uh, the kind of thing that happens in the cubicles. Uh, I, I think the name is suggestive enough yeah. itself, what it means. It means that the customer doesn't have to see the person who's servicing him, and then the person who's getting the service fantasizes that the little boy is blonde and blue-eyed and white. Well, what and about so Atlanta, on. then? Uh, you were talking in, in the previous program about this being the situation with the Atlanta kids. Well, I think there are indications, as I said, that the kids there are hustlers. They are hustlers who are out working to help their families. They are not throwaways. They are not runaways. And they are in the farm circuit. They're working out of a park. Uh, they're not in uh, the penthouses. They're not in call boy services. Uh, black kids are out there working, and they're not getting the best trade. They're getting what is called rough trade. Men who will pay less and want more and be more likely to inflict violence as part of the price. Another thing I'd like to say here is that on the basis of what I've learned over the last three years, I have a, a feeling, it, it's not a firm conclusion by any means, but it's a strong feeling that there's a second reason why the kids out there caught up in this are primarily white. The first reason is that the rich men want white boys, but I think there's a second reason, and that is that poor, struggling black families are taking better care of their kids than white families are. They're not pushing them out. The boys aren't running away. They're keeping the, the contact with home, even if they do have to resort to this for economic reasons. And when the families find out it's happening, they accept the kids and they love them. And they don't punish them, reject them, and throw them out. What, what about the kids themselves? What happens to them? Assuming they're ones that live, and can they get out of the life? And what happens to them when they do? What are they like? In the first place, they mostly don't survive. They mostly, literally, don't live to be 20 years old. As far as I know, the best information I have is, is that these kids die. They waste away, they kill themselves, somebody kills them, and that's it. And we're talking about over half. Over half of the kids who make their living this way for a period don't survive adolescence. They don't become adults. Those who do have a tremendously difficult time. Of course it does damage. It does tremendous damage to self-esteem. You have to grow up with a general bitterness towards, towards adults where you find with all this, all these strangers now into your life where you're literally being used and poured over. Mutilated. It's not even... Damage is a, a quiet word for the, the mutilation of a child's spirit. We cannot take a seven or eight year old and think that seven or eight year old has the same sexual needs and drives and concepts as you and I. Uh, we have to realize that children see things differently, use material differently, and have different ways of integrating experience. Children cannot integrate anal sodomy at eight or nine. Uh, the fact is, it's, it's all they know how to do. It's all they're good at. Uh, I came to know very well a 22-year-old hustler masquerading as a 16-year-old for whom... Uh, friends and I were able to find a job, but it wasn't a good enough job for him. He knew the risks. Over the years, he, although he was white and blonde, he had to do more and more and more for less and less and less, turn more and more tricks a day. As he got older? As he got older. Uh, one of the things that I know happened to him in the last year was that he had to be subjected to uh, penetration with bottles. And the men played the game of whether or not they'd break 
the bottle off in him or not and cut him. That kind of thing, when he was 17, he didn't have to do that, and he got more money. At 22, he pretended he was 16, the man pretended he was 16, he got less money, he had to turn more tricks, but he didn't know what else to do. He felt it was the one thing he was good at. He also admitted to being miserable. What are some of the legal problems here? How come well, more of, uh, one, the organization that's exploiting these boys hasn't been uncovered, and uh, two, the men who are participating in these uh, crimes against well, each other? Well, take the boys' homes, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, in the case in San Antonio, uh, which is still pending, there was an eyewitness who walked into the room of the director of the home at four in the morning because he was sure there would be a little boy in there. And there was a six-year-old boy in bed with this supposed priest. Now, the eyewitness testimony that a boy was in bed with an old man doesn't do anything in the courtroom. It doesn't prove that there was sex going on. If the little boy testifies, who is going to take the word of a little boy against the word of, say, a real priest? And what little boy is going to say that a priest violated, violated. Uh, It's a hard arrest to make. It's hard to get a warrant. It's hard to get an arrest. It's hard to get a conviction. And then it's hard to get a real sentence. Very hard. Nobody wants to put anybody away on this kind of charge because the evidence is, by its nature, very, very shaky. And, and very controversial as well, and, and that just points to another facet of this problem is that it, often it's just ignored, pref preferentially ignored by the courts and by the police and by society because they just don't want to believe it's happening. I remember when we did our reports, we thought it significant enough because of the nature of the case involves some Austin personnel and citizens that we put it on the front page because I was shocked personally by it. And when we printed these stories, we just were barraged with letters from people saying, basically, I don't want to read this kind of stuff over my morning coffee. You know, if, even though it happened, even though we documented it, and we'd gone out of our way to make sure that it was all backed up with fact, people just refused to want us, not only to believe it, but to even believe that it happens. So that's part of the problem. And another part of the problem is, of course, we were shocked when we found out the extent and broad nature of this of problem of pederasty and what all it involves. But we were truly shocked when we found out originally, initially when we started this a few years, a few years back, that the police department didn't even know what pederasty was. I mean, I ran in, I won't say the police department, but I know that I was dealing with one officer in sex crimes division who's no longer in sex crimes division. And I was trying to get, do my part for uh, truth and justice. <laughs> and trying to get to the root of the problem. And I said, well, tell me about your uh, case history of pederasty. And he just went blank. He had no idea what I was talking about. Now, to their credit, I will say that the Austin Police Sex Crimes Division has come a long way since then. But if the police don't know what it is, then certainly most members of society won't know what it is. So, so when they see it in the papers, and editors don't know what it is, so they're not going to print it in the first place, but occasionally when it does go through, society just writes it off as an aberration of very, you know, well, how are, the police, how are the police organized? You mentioned sex crime division, but there's, they have also, a sex the, crime there's division. also the vice squad. So what's... The yeah, vice, sex mentioned? crimes division is a, is a subset of the vice. Yeah, no, it's part of homicide in almost every city. Oh, is it? It's part of homicide. Vice has to do with pornography, obscenity, prostitution, things involving consenting adults, which may be crimes if they're performed in public or commercially. A sex crime is uh, something that in, uh, involves uh, a direct violation of the law or involves things with kids or uh, child pornography. Do you have a feel for, say, the budget and the number of personnel in vice squads compared to uh, sex crime divisions in various places? Uh, no, I, I really don't, Frank. It's something I ought to know more about. In other words, the, the emphasis the city, uh, the police department places on one. I do in Austin other. at that time, anyway. At that time, they had three people in the entire sex crimes division, and they were so overworked with just, you know, that's when the choker rapist was around, what have you. And I mean, that's, 
that pretty much exhausts their yeah. time. And they were concerned about the issue, but they just said, frankly, we, we, we're not staffed. We don't have the personnel to do it. Well, rape is a major crime. The incidence is high. Attempted rape is common. It's extremely hard to track down a rapist. These guys are working extremely hard. And then we charge them with the duty of cleaning up the streets. And in Austin, the streets are clean. In Houston, they're not. But how can they go behind the walls and find out what's going on indoors? That's extremely hard to do. Has, has there been much investigation by any police or the FBI or the judicial system of this uh, phenomenon? Or is it that it's a fairly recent phenomenon, or is it just something that they haven't dealt with historically or... Currently. There have been legislative investigations. Uh, there was a na national investigation uh, a couple of years ago uh, looking toward the goal of national legislation to protect kids. But no, there hasn't been much. There are some who would like to tell us that the problem does not exist, that to say Houston is a major center for boy prostitution is to overstate the case. That is what the Houston police tell us. And there again, it's not, uh, we don't have as many uh, male prostitutes as we do female prostitutes but when you start talking about juvenile boys 14 15 16 years old two or three cases are too many and uh, we do have a few of those well how would you talking about that a little further how would you define the problem of young boy prostitution in Houston as far as uh, the size of the problem well I'm not going to say it's one of the major problems of our city. Again, uh, we have a certain amount of it, and uh, it's our intention to try to keep the lid on it to keep it from getting any worse. Listen to Atlanta police sex crimes detective Douglas McCoy, a 10-year veteran. It is almost at this point, especially at this time of the year, almost an epidemic. Yet only a very few young boys are ever arrested. In 1978, there were seven. So far in 1979, we've had three male prostitution charges. The facts are the Atlanta Police Department is understaffed. Vice and sex crime detectives carry a heavy workload. Rapes, for example, are up almost 100% this year. Boy prostitution is near the bottom on the priority list. Local police have to change their attitudes towards the boys, thinking of them more as victims than as criminals. The change in philosophy has worked for the Los Angeles Police Department and serves as an example for other cities. When you've got a 15-year-old boy uh, out on the street selling his body, you've got to understand why he's out there. It's usually due to a poor home life. Uh, he's there to obtain the necessities of life. And you've got to look at that boy as a victim. Even though he's out there committing uh, the crime of prostitution, you still have to look at him as a victim and why he's out there. When you do bring them in, what do you do with them? You certainly don't just throw them in the county jail somewhere. We, uh, we, it takes us anywhere from two to six hours to interview. You talk to a, one of these boys for two to six hours when you first get them in? Yes, sir. Initially, they, they don't have trust in the police department because usually uh, they've had contact with a uh, uniformed policeman and the uniformed policeman will book them curfew or run away and they're sort of leery of the police department. But we'll sit down and we'll gain the, the kid's confidence, we'll talk to him, we'll tell him if he is involved in anything, that he has no, anything having to do with sex, that he's, he has done nothing wrong at all. And uh, we treat him the best we can, we'll keep in contact with the victims and we keep calling them weeks later, and we'll go out and we'll buy them lunch. And this is weeks later. You go out and get yes. together and see how the uh, boys see how doing? they're doing, progressing, and uh, they they call us quite a bit. Rehabilitation for young boy prostitutes necessitates a change in the way they are handled by penal institutions. In San Francisco, boy prostitutes from around the nation congregate near some of the plushest hotels. But in San Francisco, a boy prostitute who was arrested is given special treatment. Sheriff Richard Hungisto has set up a new program to deal with young boys. The heterosexual inmates uh, uh, are very likely to abuse, to rape the uh, younger person or the person they think has had homosexual experiences on the streets. They will take advantage of them uh, by force and sometimes they will be very, very brutal. It's a problem amongst children, juveniles and adults. So what has been your answer here? 
we house the gay inmates separately. We don't mix them in with uh, heterosexual population just for that reason. And of course, the same thing is true with juveniles. So as you view this problem and people like this come in off the street, how do you handle it? Well, what we do here is to do what we can to make sure that if there are any psychological problems that they're dealt with, and also to try to aid them with post-release help, uh, giving them uh, opportunities as much as we can to find a job, to have a place to stay and to get back on their feet so that they don't have to sell their bodies to make money. Here in Austin, uh, the sex crime unit now is, uh, to my observation, a solid unit doing the best it can. And they have something that's rare in the whole state. They have an officer whose sole job is to counsel the victims of the sex crimes. She's an old student of mine and a friend of mine. Her job was funded by the U.S. government. She lost her job uh, in the Reagan budget last month. And she had to fight, lobby in, in the city council to get retained as a police officer. They've retained her for a year. But the overall budget was cut, and her job, uh, you know, will remain in jeopardy. And it's a vital job. If I could just add to the problems of investigation and, and how Tom and I learned about all this. We just finally realized that Tom, thankfully, has, has carried on and updated the material and, and kept a close look. My uh, full participation only lasts for a period of about six months to a year. When you were a reporter. When I was a reporter. And myself and another former editor of the Daily Texan just, as soon as we got hooked on it, I mean, as soon as we found out what was going on, we went after it with entire abandon for a good period of three to six months. Almost every day we spent, we forgot our classes, we forgot our work at the newspaper, we just, we were determined to get to the root of it. And after six months, we had touched the tip of the iceberg, and we realized at that time, after spending inordinate amounts of time, money, and energy, which we didn't have to spend already, that we needed to be funded by some sort of organization much larger than ourselves and a staff much larger than ourselves to continue to find out really what was going on. So I can see how law enforcement agencies, with what little funding they have, particularly during a tax time such as ours, that it's hard to do. Uh, and as I said, the more we found out, the more questions propped up and the, and the deeper it becomes. There are so many things. If it's all right to range around a little bit here, uh, it ought to be said that in academia there's been virtually no contribution. Uh, I learned about this whole phenomenon as a teacher when a student of mine called my attention to the TV documentary Boys for Sale, which was made in Houston. I was embarrassed that I didn't know anything about the subject mentioned it to sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, social workers. They didn't know anything about it either. Then I went into the bibliography and found that it was first meager and second heavily oriented toward the defense and explication of the pederast, mm -hmm. like the lawyer's commentary wow. I quoted to you. Uh, it's considered a dirty subject and, and people aren't supposed to go into it. Every semester when I lecture on it, I have students get up and walk out. Uh, I used to have complaints made to the department, uh, to the college, to the university, and so on, that I was doing pornographic things in the classroom. Uh, that, that's abated, but people still get upset and walk out. Maybe not because they are offended, but because they're emiserated by it and they want to get away from it. Mm. People don't like to look at reality. <laughs> well, especially this, the, real as it this stuff is horrible. Uh, at any rate, if, if the police department from any major city went over to the major educational institution in its area and asked for a contribution from the faculty, that faculty could con contribute practically nothing. Academics have been not necessarily remiss, but they have been oblivious to this. Can I ask you, unless you, it would compromise your information system, how do you go about getting your information? Hmm. Observation, uh, interviewing, and uh, interviewing of many kinds. Interviewing kids, interviewing people who are willing to talk or on the other side of the street, so to speak, and investigators. Have you uh, written any books or uh, are you planning any articles or studies on this? I'm 
working on a book, and I expect it will not be the, the last book that I'll write about the subject, and I'll be teaching a course on it in the spring, and as far as I know, it'll be the first one ever taught in an American college. Hmm. Can we talk about the mass media treatment? We've kind of hit on it here and there. From what I seem to get, the electronic media, particularly a couple of TV stations, have done most of the work on it, and the uh, Newspapers haven't done much. With the exception of Mark and uh, Gary well, Fendler. Well, right, with, with the exception of the, of the Texan. Right. Well, it's interesting. Throughout all the things that we did, we thought, and perhaps we were in a minority, but we thought it was information that was in the best public interest to know, or at least be exposed to, was not touched by any other local media in town. Do you have any explanation for this? Why didn't the Austin American Statesman pick up on it? I really don't know. Or the TV station? Uh, did you ever take it to them? But uh, actually, I think the statesman did run one or two. Mm -hmm. I think they ran the initial story about Anderson, mm -hmm. the pharmacist being right. busted, and that's what sparked our interest. And right. of course, and they dropped. Lynn, did you ever talk to the uh, reporter that did that story and see why they didn't pursue the? No, I don't think I did. I think we got so wrapped up in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. just, what about down in Houston? Is there any evidence of pressure to keep it the lid on down there? Well. Uh, when Boys for Sale was shown on TV, it was shown first as a nightly series, and then there was a summary program, uh, which you'll have excerpts of. The biggest bank in Houston withdrew its advertising from the show and from the station because it showed that program. Wow. But they didn't, they didn't withdraw it until the last... Not the last minute. They kept saying, if you don't kill that program tonight, we're going to withdraw our advertising. And they did. And uh, the bank managed to get the other, the other advertisers for that program to withdraw their advertising. Uh, the Houston Post and the Houston Chronicle, again, that story I, I mentioned in the previous program about the bust of this mansion with this incredibly elaborate film studio in it, emerges in the Post and the Chronicle as a little place with some cameras. Yeah, and the problem is not so much that, it, that the incidents are ignored, but there's n never any follow-up. There's never any investigation. They just take the easy way out. Something happened, boom, it happened. Next day, it's forgotten. What we need in the media is follow-up and investigation on everybody's part, so that we won't, so that we'll be, become sensitized to the issue. You had some and threats of physical violence also when you were doing this investigation. Well, uh, this did you not? We were working with some people from Houston who knew a lot more about it than we did, and they, of course, counseled us and mm -hmm. said, "Beware." Mm -hmm. I had my windshield broken in, uh, I mean, a brick thrown through my windshield. Was, I don't know if that was entirely coincidental, I sincerely doubt it, just because of the timing and nature of the place Well, this may be one very good reason why there, hadn't been a lot of, <laughs> why there hadn't been a lot of investigative reporting now. The well, Tom can relate this story. In the Houston. The shotgun incident. Has had know. some problems. Well, uh, the moderator of the show, Boys for Sale, had a shotgun go through, blast go through his window. And then another one go through his, uh, that, that is the window of his home, mm -hmm. and then another, another blast go through the windshield of his car as he was a approaching the car to get into it. Uh, that kind of, of signal uh, usually is sufficient to uh, warn a person off. Uh, any one of us in the country, and there aren't very many of us who have worked intensely on this for a period of years, has received threats. And... Uh, has been subject to at least feigned attempts. And the idea is that that should scare us off. It, it has worked with a whole lot of people. The day after part one of Boys for Sale was cablecast, Tom Philpott's van was vandalized, the tires were slashed, and the accelerator was jammed to the floor. And then the following week, Tom was shot in what appears to have been an assassination attempt. Has anybody been killed? Actually, uh, what about the guy that wrote the book that he got a shotgun mm. blast that did wound him? I think pretty seriously, didn't it? Well, what what then should society do about this? How can this problem be dealt with? Well, it, it's a it's a tall question. Yeah. Uh, law enforcement has to has to be activated, and it has to be supported, and it has to be seen through through the end of the procedure so that you don't have congressmen uh, pleading not guilty or no contender and getting no penalty. The kids who are 
rescued in this process have got to be cared for and helped and no one really knows how to do it but it's got to be done a way has got to be found they've got to be helped and then most obviously we've got to find a way to to uh, reestablish a society which does not throw up literally a half million kids a year onto the city streets and leave them there to to be hurt uh, American families have to have support. Uh, it, it, it's good enough to say to, to families, love your children, but they have to have the wherewithal to care for their children, and obviously American families do not. Mm -hmm. These kids are not minority kids in the main, but they're mainly poor kids. They're from hard-driven, hard-living families. Uh, it, and it's so very, very sad. And, and it's so sad that we need to respond to them. We people who, who've got our stuff together and who think we know a lot about a lot of things, we just need to reach out to those kinds of kids. We need to go out there and find them. How quickly can a city like Houston move in this area? Well, we can move as quickly in this area as we should, as we have been in other areas. We can build a billion dollar Houston Center downtown, then we can certainly move quickly to solve human problems and problems of people. Father McGinnis, do you see a role for big business in Houston in, in this plan? Yeah, one role is money. You know, and a lot can, let's face it, a lot can be done with money. A lot of alternatives can be offered if we have the money to pay for them. And there's enough excess money in 10 corporations in this city to do anything we would want to to save every one of these kids. Shocking as it is, when you put it in perspective, maybe it's really not quite so unexpected considering the history of what the people have been subject to who have been under the control and rule of these people and you start to think about what's been done to the Indians, the terrible working conditions that people lived in for years and worked under for years, the dangerous condition, the pesticides that people are forced to ingest, uh, the lack of safety in the places where we work, wars where people are slaughtered. There's really a long history of this and this is, is, is this the same type of impulse turned focused just on a small boy or is this something really unique you think? That isn't easy to answer, Frank, because in all honesty, this subject has baffled me from the time I first became aware of it until this day. I can't understand it, and I'm trying very hard, and uh, it's very difficult. Uh, as an historian, I know that this society, probably above all in the world and in the history of the world, romanticizes childhood, but historical record uh, child labor for one thing indicates the society has not been good to children has not prote protected children in, in fact is contemptuous of children heartless to children and they're such helpless victims who can they go to what constituency do they have Nobody. Uh, the heartlessness that goes into it is, is certainly somehow connected with the heartlessness which uh, ground up the Indians, uh, black people, uh, immigrant laborers, poor people in general, which is motivating the cuts in social programs today. Uh, blindness to the actual living reality of people's situations. Yes, it's connected. But this is the... It's about the most hair-raising thing I think I've encountered in studying the history of my country. The slaughter of the innocents. It's the greatest slaughter of the innocents since Herod. And it goes on and on and on. And when the public gets a, a hint of it, nothing happens. Uh, the case of Price Daniel. Uh, is uh, instructive there. It came out in, in the custody hearing of Mrs. Daniel, who admitted to shooting her husband, that he attacked their son, and there was testimony that uh, he had relations with other adolescents. 
there wasn't any inquiry as to what that might mean for society. Price Daniel is one of the major names of Texas. And all these other names that we've mentioned of, of people who have been caught and let off. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any willingness to make the connections which you have implied and face them. And it's time we did, right? Yeah, you're damn right it's time we did. Uh, there needs to be police action. There needs to be action in the academy of which I am part to study this. There has to be rehabilitation for kids and most of all American families have got to be put on a footing where their children are not in jeopardy of being lost in this way. The whole society has got to answer for this. Do something about it. If we don't make this move, what do you think the results would be in Houston? It will get worse and worse and worse. And there will be kids killed. Uh, in the dead of night and dr dumped on the highway like they are right now it'll get worse it'll never get better you don't sit back and see something like this it's history has proven that and just watch it and it gets better it'll get worse much worse <laughs>